Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sake Revolution. This is America's very first sake podcast, and I am your host, John Puma from the Sake Notes, also the administrator over at the Internet Sake Discord. And I'm your host, Timothy Sullivan. I'm a sake samurai. I'm a sake educator, as well as the founder of the Urban Sake website. And every week, John and I will be here tasting and chatting about all things sake doing our best to make it fun and easy to understand. Welcome back, Tim. Yes, John. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm really happy. Happy. And we've been doing this long enough now that you know that one thing that gets me really excited in, in, in the sake world <gasps> is when sake brands I'm familiar with from the, from the other side start to come over into the United States. I always yes. get excited about that. You're you're like a kid on Christmas when you hear <laughs> a brand you like has released a new sake to the States. You are very happy. I do I know that. <laughs> ecstatic is is really the right word. And and uh, and it's happening yet again. It's a early wow. in 2023 and I already have a gift. <laughs> <laughs> so, enlighten me. What brand that you love is releasing a new sake in the States? Well, this story is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit complicated. So I'm going to mm. take you back a little bit and okay. I'm going to set us up for where we're at now. So on many of my trips to Japan, I would come across this very recognizable bottle with a very recognizable label that mm -hmm. looked vaguely like a Z mm. to my- Like Zorro. Yes, to my American eyes. <laughs> and I would see them in various colors. So the label is always black. And then the Z, quote unquote, is always in, it's like a shiny foil mm. of either like blue or see them in red or orange and blah, blah, blah. And I always knew it was from Yamaguchi. I would mm -hmm. ask where it was from. And I would always really enjoy all mm. of them. Really, mm. it's one of those things you see it sometimes and, and you see it out there and you're like, oh, I'll definitely have a glass of that because you know it's going to be good. Now... Independent of that, in the meantime, when I'm back in New York, I was starting to enjoy a lot of sake from a company called Gokyo. Mm. They were over in Yamaguchi, mm -hmm. and I want to say the first thing I had from them was a Hia Orochi that came to New York, and I thought it was absolutely fabulous. Mm. Really nice, fruity, some great, uh, almost cherry-like notes on it. Really good stuff. And... Start to explore that brewery mm -hmm. a bit more, got really into them, and lo and behold, it's the same company. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yes, this this Z, which is not a Z, we'll get to that in a moment, um, <laughs> was actually a, an imprint, a, a brand from Gokyo. And I had gone several years enjoying both of them, not knowing they're from the same, same people. maker. <laughs> Uh, but now I do. And I also know that Z is not a Z, it's a very stylized. Go. It's a hiragana go. And go means the number five in English. Right, right. So the hiragana symbol for go, it's like it's like two uh, parallel lines, squiggles almost, because hiragana, so everything's a little curved. Um, and then that the the denden, the, the um, yeah, two little the double slashes. double yeah. slash. Yeah. But I, on the on the label, they kind of put the double slash like in the middle in a way, and so it looks a little bit like a Z. I tell, look, it looks like a Z. Look at the show notes. You'll see. Uh, <laughs> it I'm does look like a Z. It does look like a Z to the untrained. <laughs> um, but uh, when I found out that it was finally coming over to the States, I was ecstatic. Absolutely ecstatic. Because again, fun brand, good stuff, something I enjoy from Japan. Something that a little bit reminds me of my trips to Japan in a way. And when you find out you're going to be able to get it here, it puts a smile on my face. That's awesome. Well, yeah. Gokyo is from Iwakuni Yamaguchi, mm -hmm. and we just had a Yamaguchi episode a few weeks ago, and we <laughs> covered Gangi, which is a we delicious did. sake we both loved, and that's yeah. from the same city. Tim, I'll take you one further. <laughs> it's from across the street, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, essentially. So yeah. there's a river that we've talked about a little bit on the show, right in Iwakuni, and on the other side of the of the riverbank is Gokyo, and on one side of the riverbank is uh, is Gangi. Yeah, Gokyo means five bridges. Mm -hmm. And we talked yeah. in the Gang in the Gangi episode. We talked about the 
Kintai Bridge in right, Iwakuni, which is five the five arches. Arcs, so it's right, an exactly. Arch bridge. So the the Gokyo refers to the five arches in that bridge. Mm-hmm. Um, so small world, Tim. It's a small world. Small world. <laughs> And I have to tell you, I looked up some information on Japanese websites about this Gokyo Sake. Mm -hmm. And when I translated it using Google Translate, several of the websites said, this is not a Z on the label. (laughs) (laughs) So it's not just me. It's not just you. Oh, good. I think anybody looking at it would Mm. think it might be a Z. Even Japanese people might think it's a Z. (laughs) (laughs) Well, having like having like romaji characters and like you know foreign characters is not completely unusual no. uh, in Japanese sake, especially if they're trying to make a splash. So I can see yeah. that. That's a really fun connection that you made. That you found this sake in Japan with this mystery <laughs> Z label that you loved, and maybe didn't understand who made it. And not then even close. <laughs> you discovered Gokyo in the states, and then kind of later connected the two and yeah. now it's coming that's that's an awesome story i really like that it is it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun so we are getting four currently four from that line are coming over to the states and the first the question that i had once i kind of understood what was going on is what separates the gokyo brand from mm-hmm. this five five brand what they call slash it, z <laughs> Z slash Z five slash not Z, um, <laughs> and it turns out that the uh, five is an exploration. Hmm. Yeah, it's an exploration of Kimoto, and not oh, wow. just like you know, not 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 necessarily modern Kimoto, but specifically Kyoke Kimoto, which, if I'm not mistaken, is quite specific. Kyoke, yes. So the Gokyo is really exploring Kyoke production. And we should talk about that a little bit because there's a little yes, bit to yes, dig definitely. into. So Kyoke is wooden barrel brewing. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, if you went to Japan like before 1910 and you walked around to sake breweries, they would mm. all be using large wooden barrels. Mm -hmm. And these are called ki oke. Ki means wood and oke is kind of like a barrel. And they're large brewing tanks that were made out of wood. And making these giant tanks out of wood was a very specialized skill that has kind of died away over the years. I'd say Mm -hmm. like after 1950, most breweries switched to enamel or stainless steel tanks. Right. So not many people brewed with these wood giant wooden barrels anymore. Mm -hmm. But I read on their website that the president of Gokyo went to an event in 2006, Wooden Barrel Sake Production Preservation Society event. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's interesting. Yeah. And he tasted sake that was brewed in a wooden barrel and kind of had this revelation that this deserves preserving. And mm. it's important to note that miso and soy sauce production is still done in these large wooden vats, mm-hmm. these large wooden mm-hmm. barrels. So he was thinking why – that those are both fermentation. Why doesn't the sake industry preserve mm. these wooden barrels as well? So he got really interested in reviving the art of brewing in these wooden barrels, these kiyoke production. And they started harvesting cedar from the Nishiki River, which is the river that runs through Iwakuni. Mm-hmm. And it takes about 10 days. A team of people, it takes about 10 days to make one of these barrels. So it's oh, wow. very labor intensive. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was one one interesting thing that I learned when I was looking into these barrels. When you cut the cedar tree mm-hmm. down and you look at the the stump, there's the heartwood, which is like, looks like a redwood tree. It's like a reddish color. Mm -hmm. But then on the outside, you have white wood that is like a ring around the outside. So that's the sapwood. I'm with you. So when they cut the staves for the barrel, they only use the part of the tree that contains both the sapwood and the heartwood. So it's, they cut it from a very specific part because the sapwood, the redwood is the best 
wood to be facing the sake and they want the white wood on the outside of the barrel. So that very specific part of each tree has to be cut. It was just fascinating the amount. You think, oh, they cut down the tree and they make it. But there's a very, very interesting way that they construct these Mm. barrels that has been honed over centuries. So Mm. I thought that was really cool. It is. So they're they're going and making this very old style of of Kimoto. Yeah. To make this very modern label. <laughs> I don't think they were doing foil label on sake in, in 1910. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is very interesting how they you know, he's kind of like bringing old and new together in a way. And and I'll be a little bit more evident also when we start talking about that the, these sakes are this line of sake is very different. Like each one is very different, even though they're all made using this old method. Yeah. So this, it's a series of six different sakes, right? Uh, yeah. The whole series is six. Yeah. And they also explore a little bit of seasonality too, don't they? Like they're made at different times of the year, I think. I believe so. Yeah. So it's the so-called five series from Go. But there's six of them. The, <laughs> 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 There's six of them. I don't know. I feel like if they would have gone with five of them, it would have been a slam dunk. <laughs> um, and as we said before, they're all brewed in these kioke or uh, wooden barrels, mm-hmm. and they're all Kimoto method. Right, exactly. But again, very different style for each one. I'm going to quickly and briefly kind of go through each one mm-hmm. of the of the entire line and mm-hmm. I'll talk you know I'll specify which ones are available to us here in the states and then I'm going to specify which one we're going to be talking about today cuz we're okay. not going to I'm sorry Tim we're not going to drink four sakes today. <laughs> I know you were very chomping Dang a bit it. about that. Yeah. <laughs> However, um as I mentioned earlier, the labels on these are very simple. You have the the black background, black matte background and then the foil totally not a Z. <laughs> Of a different color. The Hiragana 5 that's totally not a Z. <laughs> yes. The Hiragana 5 that is definitely not a Z uh, <laughs> is is just the main thing you see on the front. And uh, the color of that 5 represents, of, of the Go, represents which one of the bottles you have. And so the red is mm-hmm. uh, the Junmai Karakuchi, and that is a 11.5 sake meter value, a really, really dry sake, mm-hmm. a Junmai. The blue is a Junmai Ginjo Nama hmm. that is uh, that uses um, slightly different rice and different yeast. The orange, which is the one we're going to be talking about today, is a Junmai Ginjo also. Uh, very similar to the Nama that's the blue, but uses a different yeast. So it's always a little bit different. Always hmm. something different with these. The yellow is a Junmai that uses... Shiro Koji. This is white Koji. Mm-hmm. And then you have the pink, which is a Junmai Daiginjo Namagenshu. Unfortunately, this is not one that's coming to the States mm-hmm. right now. Uses different rice, uses different yeast than the rest of them, but they're all connected with that Kyoke Kimoto production style. Yeah. And then finally, we have the green, which mm-hmm. is a Junmai Genshu Origarami. So a little mm-hmm. bit of particulate in there. And different rice again and different milling and another different yeast. So it's a very interesting line. And when I first saw this, that's when I was like, well, wait a minute, what is connecting all these? And that's Mm. when I found out that is the Kyoke Kimoto that Mm. binds them all together. Is that green one also imported? (laughs) No, unfortunately not. Okay, so the pink pink and the green are not The pink and the green are not imported. The red, the blue, the orange, and the yellow are. So you can get four out of the Six of the five. Five. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And of the of the four of the five series, we're going to taste one. Right. <laughs> so, See, easy. This is easy. It's easy. It's, it's, it's just math. Um, it's just, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let's dive deep into the orange. So that's the yes. one we got. So remind us what the orange is and give us the stats for that one. Yes, yes, I'd be happy to. So the orange is Junmai Ginjo. Uh, it uses Yamanashiki rice that has been grown in Yamaguchi. It is milled down to 55% of its original size. 
The sake meter value is plus one, so very close to neutral on that. Um, the acidity is 1.8, so not nothing too crazy there. The alcohol percentage is 15%, nice and, nice and normal right there. Uh, and the yeast is uh, 701. All right. I believe this is a Nama Zume, once pasteurized mm -hmm. and aged over the summer and then released mm. in the fall. So nice. uh, Hiaroshi as well. So this is our orange, definitely not a Z, five. <laughs> of a series of six. <laughs> of a series of six, <laughs> of which we're tasting one. <laughs> right. <laughs> Never gets old. <laughs> no, no, we're going to get a lot of mileage out of this one. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the label, we're looking at it right here, and it is in the show notes, so please take a look at the show notes to see it yourself. It's a matte black with a slightly foiled orange, totally not a Z, but it really kind of looks like a Z. It really looks like a it Z. Really <laughs> like a Z. And then um, in the past, I've seen these have the word five underneath. I think somebody got upset that people were not recognizing that it was a go <laughs> and we're instead saying Z. Uh, now it just says orange uh, to help people. So the who color. Are blind, I guess. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, yeah, now it actually says the color. So it says orange in this case. Uh, it is also in orange. It says, or it says orange in orange on the bottle. Below the which Z. Which is a five <laughs> out of six. That we're going to taste one. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, Gokyo... Go series orange. Let's get this in the glass and give it a taste because my yes. interest is peaked. I have never tried this before, so I can't Excellent. wait to try it. All right. All righty. Mm. So we've got this in the glass. Little hint of color here, a little bit uh, slightly yeah. golden color. Mm -hmm. and... um, but I don't see a whole lot in there, so it's pretty... Pretty transparent, pretty clear. Hmm. Hmm. So, really nice aroma. I'm yeah. I'm getting um, mm. Mm, right off the nose. I'm getting it smells like tangerine skins to me. Like when you peel a tangerine and you get that smell yes. on your fingers, that orange citrus smell. Right. Orange but, but oil, stronger orange like a tangerine, not like yeah. an orange though. Yeah. Maybe like a mandarin orange, but I think tangerine mm. is probably yeah. closer for a lot of people. So there's a, a orangey citrus note on the aroma. Mm. Really concentrated too. There's a there's almost a little bite on the mm. end of that aroma though. Really nice though. Mm. All right, I'm gonna taste. Mm, very smooth. And I, mm -hmm. I'm I'm also getting like a citrus. Almost like an orange juice a hint of OJ. Mm. It's a um, little bit of a lemon peel, orange blossom, really lovely citrus um, flavor as well. Yeah. Maybe a hint and of rice in the background. Yeah. Really tasty. Like this is mm. really – and it is – and it is. I think, you know, this reads, when I mean, you look at the, the, the stats, I guess, this reads as a really light, refreshing sake. Mm. And I'm getting a lot of that from it. It is very light, easy drinking. This is definitely something that you could accidentally, oh, where'd the bottle go? <laughs> <laughs> I... This basically that might this happen the on your couch. Tonight. It might. It might. This <laughs> definitely fits the criteria for John Sipsis on the couch while watching some TV. The other thing that stays with me sipping on this is mm -hmm. the the finish lingers on my palate. Like this is not clean and dry on the finish. Like all, we no. often say that oh this finish is dry, this finish is dry. This one lingers, and there is a a, a weight for me there that continues to express flavor and that citrus note and that that uh orange blossom flavor just kind of continues for me and that's not so common in sake where you have that i call it a wine like finish where it lingers and and mm. you have that coating and i i really like that here it complements the flavor very well yeah and i i will say though for me the the lingering flavor is that faint orange mm. 
that's the bit that hangs around for me. Yes, yes. And that's really interesting. It's a lot of fun. I'm really liking this. It's a little unusual, but it's a really interesting style. I really like this a lot. And what's really interesting to me is that this line is all about exploring this old style of sake making. But this is a very modern tasting sake to me. Yes, 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 yes. Right. It doesn't have the, it's not super modern in the high acidity and blah, 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 but it's really, really nice, modern, smooth, clean. Like this is textbook Junmai Ginjo. Really nice. But then mm. with that citrusy quality to it, which you usually don't get, you usually get a lot more tropical fruit. Mm-hmm. This is much more specifically citrusy. And, uh, and as you pointed out, like orange almost. Hey, look at that. The label's orange. <laughs> <laughs> just occurred to me. It really just, it horns in on that and does a really great job. And it's real. this is a really interesting, almost a bit of a twist on your typical Jin Mai Ginjo and a very pleasant twist for me. Yeah. I think we also have to consider that this was brewed in a wooden barrel and that it's a Kimoto method. Mm-hmm. Kimoto, again, is that yeast starter where they allow lactic acid to build up naturally over time. Mm-hmm. And that can introduce a funky flavors on occasion for some Kimoto sakes. And I'm not getting that hardcore, earthy, super ricey Kimoto style flavor no, here. Not at all. Yeah. But there is depth there. There, it, yes. This isn't a light, airy, citrusy sake. Th- there's some depth, a little bit of funk, a little bit of weight, and it does linger on the palate. So I think that what the Kimoto and the wooden barrel are bringing to the table are giving you some depth, some dimension, and some weight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you taste those things as well? Like the little bit of depth of flavor there? I think it's really engaging. There's something I had said uh, a couple of weeks back when we were tasting a sake that was similarly light if you want it to be, and then depth if you want to explore it. It's like light if you just want to sip on it, but then if you really wanted to think about it and really um, let it linger around your mouth a little bit longer, if you really want to explore it, there's, there is depth there. So it can appeal to people who are looking for both, which I think mm-hmm. is great because I'm sometimes looking for one, sometimes looking for the other. Yeah. And um, that's really nice. So, John, I know that one of your New Year's resolutions was focusing more on food pairing. So I'm going to put you on the spot. And I rem- I, I recommended that you pay attention while you're eating. <laughs> do you remember that? I do. I do. I do. <laughs> pay attention while you're eating. meals since we <laughs> know, It's only been a couple of weeks, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's, um, let's take it apart. Like this it has some weight to it. It does. I think it can stand up to... You know, you want to look at the weight of the sake first. If it's light, airy, super clean, you're not going to pair that with rich, heavy foods. This has some medium-bodied tones to it. Mm -hmm. It's got some weight from the Kimoto method, from the wooden barrel fermentation. So I think it has a chance with some dishes that have a little bit more funk, a little bit more weight to them. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And it has that that citrus, that orangey note for me, a little bit of... Uh, a tangerine peel or orange blossom aroma, just a really lovely little citrus kick there. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing that I would pay attention to when you think about what to pair with this. So here's a, here's a question for you yeah. as somebody who's learning about pairing. Yeah. Since this does have that, that citrus kick to it, mm-hmm. would I then be looking at foods that also have a little bit of a citrus kick to them? Or am I looking for foods that would enjoy a citrus kick if they had them? That's a great question. And the answer is both. Oh, one is One is <laughs> complementary. So mm-hmm. if you find a little hint of citrus or orange in your sake and you want to pair that with a complementary pairing, think about a salad with orange slices in it or mm. orange chicken or something like that. So that's mm-hmm. complementing by layering the same flavor. Like you're, you're pulling out the orange in the sake by serving a dish with orange in it. But your your other point of view is just as valid, where if you're having a salad and it has grapes in it, but you think a squeeze of orange juice in the in the vinaigrette would be a great addition, bring in this sake and you have your little hint of orange that way. Mm. So you can think of it as a phantom <laughs> complementary flavor for your food. So there's two ways of approaching it. Uh, both oh. are valid and both are fun. So that's that's... One thing that makes sake and food pairing uh, 
interesting and maybe a touch complex is that <laughs> you can approach it in different ways. There's not mm -hmm. one black and white formula for it. So uh, I mentioned a couple of things. I mentioned the salad with the uh, citrus or the orange wedges. That's something I've had a few times. And orange mm. chicken is another another one. Mm -hmm. uh, any other thing popped to mind for you? Well, the nice thing about citrus is that it's a little bit broad. Mm. And I'm hoping that the orange specific aspects of this wouldn't preclude me from doing this. But I have some chicken katsu that we made recently mm. that we put a lot of lemon pepper mm. in the batter when we were making it. Yeah, And every time I eat this, it, it has a really nice little, little burst of citrus. Mm. And I'm wondering, will this pair with that? That might be fun. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I will probably do that for dinner tonight. <laughs> Yeah, that that that's a great that's a great way to think about it. You know, you can mm. make these connections, and there the great thing about sake is there's lots of forgiving room when it comes to food and sake pairing. Mm. Very little you can do that will truly take you off the rails. Mm. So it, it can be wonderful to identify those little threads of flavor in the sake and look where they might meet up with your meal. Mm. Um, so I might have to do this and then report back. Yes, in our next episode. This is a sake revolution resolution. Yes. So I might need assistance from sake revolution to help me truly um, accomplish it. Yes. We're going to keep you honest, John. Keep your feet to the fire. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I don't mind being kept honest. It's all good. Yeah. There's, there's another food pairing that I thought of and I'm kind of like, maybe it's not as ideal mm -hmm. have you know when you have ceviche that is okay. a raw fish that is mm -hmm. cooked quote unquote cooked in citrus right Usually the, lime. the acid from the citrus exactly it it gently cooks the outside of the fish by marinating it and i was wondering you know oh that has a little citrus note to it could that be a good pairing i think it would work but there's a depth here there's that woody Mm. Kimoto vibe under the current of this sake gives mm -hmm. it a little more weight and depth of flavor. And I think the very delicate sashimi from a ceviche might be a little bit too light. But that's another thing that popped into my mind. Maybe it would work. Maybe it it might be the sake might overwhelm a little bit. Mm. But just another thing that popped into my mind. I think that if you tried them together, you wouldn't go, oh my God, this is horrible. But <laughs> <laughs> so but, it's a question of like how close, how, how, how good is it? Right. Exactly. So it's not going to be bad. It just may not be right. as good as you want. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. And this is, I'm imagining that now. I haven't had a uh, ceviche in quite a long time, but mm. I'm thinking this could work. I'm really mm. thinking this could work. And you may need to play with the temperature of the sake a little bit. Mm. But I yeah. think there's there's room for this. This can be awesome. <laughs> mm. Yeah. My initial, like when I first sipped this sake, my initial reaction was, oh, I'm going to want something a little meatier, a little heavier, because this has some weight, some depth of flavor. And sashimi, mm. uh, cooked in acid or not, is not my first thought. Mm -hmm. But it has that citrus component that kind of yeah. made me think it might be a good fit. By the way, as this warms up, it's been you know, sitting in our glasses for a little bit now. As it warms up, I'm getting a lot more of that depth, a lot more of that mm. that body. I want to say that when this was cold, it was a lot lighter. When it was when, when I pulled it out of the fridge, well, it was it was a lot lighter, <laughs> uh, and it ooh. is gaining momentum as it comes up to room temperature. And it's yeah. it's a it's a fun sake. This is a fun sake to sip on. Yeah, I mean that's true for a lot of sakes. When you drink them a little more well chilled, they're a little tighter, a little crisper. Mm -hmm. And as they warm up more towards room temperature, they open up and get a little more depth of flavor. And that's definitely true here too, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, John, it was fun to visit Yamaguchi again. Not just Yamaguchi, but Iwakuni again. <laughs> this is becoming a bit of a habit for us. <laughs> yes, <too. laughs> it is. <laughs> but they make so much good sake. And we will be having another Yamaguchi episode when we have our friend Jim Ryan yes. from Sake Deep Dive Podcast on to talk about his new book that focuses specifically on Yamaguchi sake. So this is mm. not the end of Yamaguchi by any means. We've got yeah. more coming. 
Yeah, I, I, we just have to figure out how we're going to categorize that episode. Is it going to be a deep dive part two on Yamaguchi? Is it going to be an interview about his book? Is it going to be a connection with his podcast? Is it all of them at once? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a question for another day. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, great to taste with you, John. Thanks for getting your hands on this really interesting Go or five sake series from Go Kyo. Mm -hmm. So interesting to taste this sake. Wonderful, uh, unique flavors. And I hope that our listeners can get their hands on it too. And of course, check our show notes to see where to buy it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will again be exploring a little bit more of Yamaguchi in future episodes. But this was a wonderful revisit of a prefecture that we absolutely love their sake. And I'm looking forward to more. John, it was so great to taste with you. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in as always. Mm -hmm. And a special hello and hi and thank you to our patrons. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash sake revolution to learn more about our tiers and different ways that you can support our podcast. And another thing you can do while you're over at sakerevolution.com checking out the show notes, you can also check out our store. We've got swag. We've got t-shirts. We've got stickers. You can wear some Sake Revolution merchandise, show it around. People ask, what is Sake Revolution? You can tell them it's America's first sake podcast. So without any further ado, please raise your glasses. Remember to keep drinking sake and come on.